Uh, we have a special strategic guest star today. This is Imtiaz. Everybody say hi. Hi. Uh, he is awesome. Um, he just did another class just a few minutes ago. Uh, he's going to talk about data, clean rooms, digital, um, baby formula, and how to market baby formula, which is fascinating, by the way. And um, talk's going to be pretty short. So we'll, um, we'll have plenty of time for questions, which I don't have to worry about this group. Um, and then uh, we'll probably end a little early. And then if you want, you can work on your projects or get out of here for your vacation. Sound good? So let's give a huge round of applause. Thank you, everyone. Um, firstly, we'll go through agenda in terms of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, firstly, who am I? How did I get here? Uh, what is retail media in terms of the specialization that I have right now? Uh, what is a data clean room? And we'll go through a case study of uh, how to use a data clean room, uh, and then I'll give you some takeaways. So firstly, the company that I work for, uh, Reckitt is a multinational CPG. We play in three key categories. One is infant formula, um, so baby formula. Uh, two is household cleaning, so we have uh, brands like uh, Finish, Vanish, uh, and Lysol, uh, which was massively impacted by the uh, global pandemic. And in Asian countries, we also own uh, Dettol as well. And then in personal care and healthcare, uh, we have a, we own Mucinex, we own a, a whole heap of vitamins uh, and wellness brands as well. Cool? So in terms of uh, who am I and how did I get here, uh, I've been at Racket now just over 15 years. I started in the Australian business. Uh, I started as a grad when I was 20 years old. Uh, my first role was on the field uh, selling to retail pharmacy, so learning everything from you know, how to influence buyers at, uh, at a physical retail store. Then I moved into uh, operations, so looking and managing uh, all of the field teams that we had all across Australia at the time. From there, I shifted into uh, account management, so looking after customers like Woolworths and Coles uh, in Australia. Uh, then I transitioned into trade and shopper marketing, uh, which is very different to your traditional brand marketing as such, and really un analyzing and understanding uh, the retail mechanics that you could use at the time to influence purchase. Uh, and then this thing called e-commerce pops up uh, about 10 odd years ago uh, in, in CPG. So e-commerce has been around for a lot longer than 10 years, but about 10 years ago, um, e-commerce got really serious in CPG. And uh, I had no qualification to, to get into e-commerce, uh, and my manager at the time was like, uh, you're good at PowerPoint and Excel. Can you go figure out this digital stuff for us? Um, so that was like my in to, to digital marketing and e-commerce at the time. Um, so within that role, uh, I launched our first direct-to-consumer business model. So Reckitt and most CPG uh, even today is very B2B. So we sell on to retailers who then sell on to consumers. Uh, this was the first time we were taking the foray into uh, direct-to-consumer uh, sales. So I, I kind of, I, I headed up that uh, business model and created the internal financial processes uh, to kind of do that. From there, uh, e-commerce got even more serious within CPG. So I moved to London, our global head office, and started looking at uh, multiple markets, our top 40 markets, and uh, trying to understand who were, were the key players in each one of those markets and what is the type of organization per market that we needed to kind of design in order to win in e-commerce per market. From there, I did, decided to specialize in direct-to-consumer e-commerce. Uh, it was a very big passion of mine at the time, uh, considering that you know, I had to uh, pick up the skills of one-to-one -one marketing. So rather than mass reach media, which is what CPG is built off, I had to learn Google and Facebook at the time as well as uh, learn new software and new platforms like Shopify uh, in order to actually uh, sell directly to consumer and then scale that out across our Western European markets as well as the US. Also, within that time in global, um, we really started to see the development of e-commerce at massively different rates in, in different countries uh, all at the same time. China, and, and it's still true for China right now in terms of e-commerce development in China is leading the way globally versus what we have in the US. Um, but we're trying to take some of those learnings and trying to deploy them across the world as well. Uh, so as we 
you know, further uh, got into direct-to-consumer e-commerce. Uh, Reckitt bought a company called Mead Johnson here in the US, uh, which is a baby formula business. Uh, Mead Johnson already had a sizable direct-to-consumer business already. Uh, and I, was, I moved here in March of 2020 at the height of the pandemic uh, to scale up our uh, direct-to-consumer business. Uh, in that time, our run rates just went like 40x in overnight. So, you know, a business that was not used to doing the volumes that it was doing literally just went haywire. Um, so managing that insane time uh, and managing, you know, how do you 40x your output uh, literally overnight was, you know, fun, uh, to put it lightly. Um, and then over the last two years, uh, I've specialized in performance media. And what performance media means is uh, specifically retail media. So now, uh, myself and my team, we manage um, retail media across Amazon, Walmart, Target, Instacart, uh, and all the major retailers here in the US. Cool? Um, so I do that for my corporate job, and that's what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, beyond corporate, uh, I've just started, and uh, earlier this year, I launched my own podcast called Applied Intelligence, which is looking at generative AI and the applications of AI. Uh, when it comes to CPG in, in particular, uh, as well as broader applications across that as well. Uh, I'm also contributing to HBR in terms of generative AI uh, and you know, how this new thing is, is going to progress over time. Um, I, also touching on HBR um, and Harvard Business School, um, throughout the pandemic, I also did a data science program through Harvard uh, because when I went to school you know, 15, 16 years ago, uh, data science wasn't really a thing, and the applications of data science, specifically within marketing, wasn't that big. Um, so I had to pick up some new skills in terms of really understanding how we could use data science uh, in all the things that we were doing. Additionally, I was hiring data scientists, and I didn't want to look like that idiot that has no idea what he's talking about, but commanding a, a technical team as well. The second one is uh, Startup Bus, and I highly recommend everyone have a look at um, Startup Bus. Startup bus is basically a hackathon on a bus. Uh, so you, within 72 hours, you go out and you build a product uh, with a tech team. Uh, you launch that product, you get paying customers, you try and raise funding for your idea, uh, all whilst you're on a bus with dodgy Wi-Fi uh, heading to a, a startup event. So it's a highly pressurized environment, forces you to uh, really make decisions on the fly uh, and build something very quickly. So that, we'll go into a little bit more detail on, on that later. Um, but to really learn this stuff, you really need to do the stuff. You can't just uh, academically look at this, these technologies and just be like 20 feet away from it. You need to be on the ground uh, to really learn it properly. Moving on. Um, over the last, I want to say, 10 odd years, there's been two seismic shifts within uh, CPG across distribution as well and in media. So across distribution, what it was, you know, we, we've typically been a uh, B2B type organization selling to brick and mortar retailers. Uh, and that change catalyst over the last odd, 10 odd years has been e-commerce. So really, you know, um, seeing consumers go on Amazon, go on walmart.com, go on all these various apps like Instacart, et cetera, uh, and start shopping there. And the pandemic only accelerated that change uh, significantly, specifically here in the West. And then where it's going, though, is you know, companies like us, advertisers like us, uh, we're looking at the omni shopper now because you know, people are returning back to store, people are returning back to uh, the, their traditional, more traditional type of shopping habits, and digital is just playing, or e-commerce is just playing a part in that role now. And then from a media point of view, uh, when I started my career, we're heavy on reach and frequency type media, so television, print, radio. Uh, then Facebook and Google kind of take off and you have to learn all these new things. Uh, and now what is, what is happening is retail media. And we're going to go into retail, what retail media is in, in more detail in the coming slides. But now you have big players like Amazon and Walmart uh, that are leveraging the eyeballs that are hitting their apps, their websites, and as well as their physical store footprint as well, and working out how did they actually monetize that uh, effectively for their own P&L. So what is a retail media network? 
Um, so all of the uh, retailers in, here in the US, specifically the big ones, and we'll talk about the big ones today, um, they all have something that CPGs don't have, which is a high volume of uh, transactional data from consumers that as a brand advertiser, as a CPG that I actually wanna advertise to and, and get to. So what, that's something I don't have. So what they've uh, effectively done now is put retail media uh, placements on all over their websites, their apps, and even in physical stores that I can actually buy against. The most common one uh, that CPGs buy from a retail media network currently is search. So as you're typing in baby formula on, on Amazon or Walmart, you're getting served product ads, uh, in-grid product ads, uh, as well as uh, additional ads like display media ads where we're showing creative as well. Um, so th those would be the two most common uh, ads that we're showing you. Uh, on top of that, uh, we're also looking at correlated categories as well, right? So if you're buying, um, if you're starting to search for uh, prenatal vitamins right now, and you're using the keyword prenatal vitamin, you might not have a baby right now, you might have a baby in the future, but you're certainly interested in our category today. Similarly, if you've bought baby formula and you've bought it for nine months, 12 months, um, your, your baby's transitioning into a toddler and we have a toddler portfolio uh, that we wanna start to advertise to you as well. So we might not necessarily use search media to advertise that to you, we would more so use display media uh, as well. And I'll go, we'll go into some content and creative there as well. The third point here is uh, customer insights. So correlated to uh, the purchasing behavior, we're now also seeing the media attribution against that path to purchase that a consumer is having. Uh, and we're learning how to activate the best type of creative against that uh, to optimize for conversion and sales. And we'll go into more detail about that uh, in the coming, in the, in, in the case study. So finally, uh, what's really interesting about this stuff is uh, data clean rooms. Uh, a data clean room, and we're gonna go into further detail in the coming slides, is a new technology in which you know, all of these things kind of piece together in a systematic way that a brand advertiser and a publisher can actually activate media accordingly. Cool. Any questions on this slide before we head out? No? Yes? So we track success um, more so at an aggregate level rather than a um, individual level. When you when you run your own Shopify store, you know you can see that person's email address and physical address, and you can see on Google Analytics exactly what were the media touch points that if you've tagged your website properly and your media properly, you can see exactly the touch points that they had uh, in order to, to convert. Um, using a data clean room, you can do that uh, at a audience size of 2,000 identities, okay? So rather than one to, rather than one, to one on D to C, the smallest granularity that I've seen so far is one to 2,000, okay. yeah? So it's just getting that fidelity or higher definition of targeting um, significantly better than we've ever had before. Before I was buying um, media with audience sizes of 100,000, a million, whatever it was, and simply too high, especially in the category that I work in, which is baby formula, um, where you have 10,000 babies being born every day and then 10,000 babies leaving the category every day. There's only 1% category, sorry, 1% birth rate growth in the US and breastfeeding is increasing, so total volume in this category is not increasing. So we have to either capture share from our competitors and or grow lifetime value within the time frame that consumers are actually buying baby formula. So what are data clean rooms and how do they uh, actually work? Data clean rooms are where ad publishers, so your, your Google, your Metas, your uh, Amazon and Walmart, um, Walmarts of the world are sharing their aggregated data uh, rather than their customer level data. So just like we just said before, rather than at a one-to-one -to -one level, I'm looking at a one to 2,000 level customer cohort at a time uh, that I get to create uh, in order to target. So that first party data from the advertiser is then poured into the same place where I as an advertiser can take my data, commingle it in, in, in one place uh, and start activating against that, right? So as 
uh, as Enfamil, which is the baby formula that, that Racket makes here in the US, uh, we do a lot of product sampling and we do a lot of CRM uh, and we're capturing upwards of 90% of first time mums uh, that are uh, coming into the category and we're sampling products to their homes, et cetera. So we're capturing all of that information on our side. We're looking at the behaviors on the retail media side and we're co-mingling that data in, inside this data clean room, okay? So the three ways that you can use a data clean room. One uh, is for uh, campaign effectiveness and optimization. So it's a, more of a historical view of how your uh, media has performed over time. Uh, secondly is research insights and uh, audience planning. Um, this is, think about it like if I change my media mix from what it is today to tomorrow, if I downweight search and then upweight display or upweight video, what would the change uh, potentially be from an ad performance point of view? And then thirdly is um, audience decisioning and targeting. So actually using all of this data that you have on your side and the retailer side uh, to actually look at who you're going to target in real time. So to make it very simple, data clean rooms are akin to a middle school dance. So <laughs> you have uh, you have the boys on one side, which is your, your one party data, and the girls on the other side of the, the room, uh, which is your publisher or your retail media data, uh, and there is a heavily chaperoned temporary interaction between the two. And uh, after that interaction is done, you go back to your wall. So just think that the, what, um, who these people are is not important, and from a privacy uh, and a data governance point of view, when you're signing, the t when you're agreeing, no one really reads T's and C's when, when it comes to signing up to new apps. But what you're agreeing to with, um, with the likes of Amazon and Walmart is that they're not going to share uh, your personal information and your personal um, shopping behavior with uh, other people, <laughs> other stakeholders at an individually identifiable level. What this data clean room enables us to do is look at certain behavioral traits that somebody has done on a retail media network uh, and then action against that. And we'll come into to more detail for that, okay? So um, to kick off the case study, uh, Amazon is uh, by far the leader when it comes to uh, activating data clean rooms here in the US. And our objective of this uh, initiative that we, took, uh, that we started was to shoot more bullseyes effectively to cut waste and reach uh, and only to expose the ads to the people that were most relevant uh, for that particular product category at any given time. So I said to you, there's only 10,000 babies coming into this category uh, every day and then there's equivalent 10,000 people leaving the category uh, as well. And if you think about the, uh, the path to purchase uh, within this category, the, the formula that is sampled at hospital or sampled by the pediatrician to the family is the highest likely market share winner uh, at the time. Then what happens is one in three babies uh, has a feeding issue. So they're allergic to cow's milk formula, um, they're allergic to some type of protein and they go into a more specialized formula. But that's one in three babies, which is relatively large. Our job is to ensure that, you know, that baby stays within our product portfolio and doesn't go to a competitor. So if you think about that customer journey, within uh, once uh, a family has decided to move to baby formula, they try what they have been given. Um, if the baby settles on that, then it's fine. We have super high loyalty within this category. But if they're not, they're, they're switching. So they're researching what's wrong with my baby. They're speaking to multiple healthcare professionals and then they're switching, right? Um, most babies after that first switch kind of stick to that formula. Um, other babies who have more severe conditions will, might switch again and again, right? But for us, after like between 60 to 90 days after you've started formula, you're super sticky to that brand. And you're super loyal to that brand. No amount of marketing is gonna really, no amount of media is really going to change which brand you choose once your baby is happy uh, with a uh, with a certain formula. So for us, it's not just looking at the lifetime value, which is about, which you know, occurs between nine to 12 months. Uh, it's really thinking about what points in that journey can I really influence the sale of one of my products. On top of that, you know, we're realizing between 400 to 1200 
dollars worth of lifetime value within that time, based on what um, based on what brand you're choosing within that portfolio. Um, so for us, it's really ensuring that we have high frequency in that early stage uh, of a baby's journey into baby formula, rather than thinking about uh, advertising to them for the entire period of time. Um, so the other piece here is we want to trade them up to, to more expensive products and better products within our portfolio and grow that lifetime value uh, within our flanker brands as well as our agentship categories as well. So what we actually did here was create weekly cohorts from our database, from our um, CRM program. We exported it into Amazon Marketing Cloud uh, and then displayed sequential advertising to them to each cohort based on age and stage and customer journey, as well as looking at some um, uh, behavioral insights coming right straight out of the retail media platform. So we also uh, built lookalike models, so people who exerted similar behaviors to um, the people that we were initially targeting and built our audiences this way. So this is just some example ad creative uh, on the vitamins portfolio that we have in, in Baby Formula. Um, so this was the initial pilot that we did uh, in terms of um, this initiative. Then we've moved on to doing the rest of our uh, baby formula portfolio as well. So the ads that we were um, displaying were typically display ads, uh, but now the model has moved on to doing video as well. So what were we optimizing uh, and testing against? So in performance media, you know, you're re really responsible for doing two things. One, get more sales, and two, get it cheaper. Uh, and the way you use this and the way you leverage this uh, data clean room is thinking about the three levers that you can really push. The first one is audience. Who am I actually targeting? What are the behavioral insights that the retail media platform can give me versus what the, the data on my CRM can actually do, give me? And how do I kind of use that? So a behavioral insight from an Amazon could be somebody who searched for my brand or somebody who searched a category keyword or somebody who searched a competitor keyword over the last 30 days and did not purchase, right? For me, that's a highly incremental sale because uh, they did not purchase, right? And especially if it comes from a category keyword and or a competitor keyword, in this category in particular, it is highly incremental to me considering the, the market is so small in terms of daily new users coming into to the category. So secondly is looking at budget. How much do I uh, actually want to invest in media on a day-to-day -day basis to convert these people into my brand? And does it make sense for me to spend my entire daily budget today or do I hold on to my budget uh, and spend it tomorrow? Uh, one of the really interesting things here, and you, you've got to think about uh, your product category as well, is that sometimes um, it's not just optimizing your media spend to the products that are being uh, displayed to the customer today, but it's also thinking about the total portfolio that you have around your brand as well. So uh, I might be selling you Enfamil um, vitamins today, but tomorrow I know you're going to be buying uh, infant formula. So how do I hold my budget right now and not overspend on something today uh, and then invest in the future to get you to buy baby formula, which is way more expensive and way more uh, valuable to me um, to manage my budget. And then thirdly is looking at, sorry, you had a question? So there's two ways. One is uh, I can match my first party data uh, to Amazon and I can create an audience on Amazon at a minimum audience size of 2,000 identities. And I know those people because they exist on my side, okay? Another type of audience that I could create is uh, searched baby formula, did not purchase last 30 days. Uh, and that could be as small as 2,000 people uh, and then I can buy media against the, that audience and I, I give that uh, audience a title or a name uh, and then I can create hundreds of these audiences and look at that. So instead of one to one, now it's one to 2,000. Cool. Uh, and then finally is, is looking at the right settings of your uh, media. 
So what that means is across um, your, the bids that you put against uh, you, the audience, so uh, within Amazon, it's a, you, you actually bid against audiences. It's not just buying set impression values at a, at a fixed price. Um, what bid do you place against uh, the, the audience? And at what frequency do you need to display your ads in order to get that uh, conversion as well? So across these two uh, lever, sorry, across these two objectives, um, the model is, is optimizing everything for us. Uh, on, on display media, it's impression-based. Whereas on search media, it's click-based. But you can measure uh, uh, CTR. So you can measure the click-through rates and you can look at the clicks on, on display. Um, but from a payment point of view, um, we, we buy on uh, impressions. So how does the model work? So in terms of uh, input data sources, on our side, we have our CDP, which is a customer data platform. Just think about it like a, a glorified uh, a database where all of our um, customer information or all of our consumer information is sitting. Uh, this is where we're housing all of that information in terms of who is receiving a product sample, um, who has installed our NFML app on their phone, uh, what interactions are they uh, having on our website, for example, or are centralized in one place. Then we're taking the Amazon ads, uh, ads reporting out of Amazon as well, looking at our historical campaigns, how have they performed against these audiences, et cetera. And then finally taking the audience reporting out of our media software as well. So we, don't, uh, we use an additional piece of technology to buy all of this media um, from Amazon in particular, um, and we're ingesting all of that into the optimization model. So what the optimization model does is ingests all of this input data, it is creating those audiences, it is creating those campaigns, it is shooting them into the Amazon Ads DSP um, where all the display media is, is happening. Um, it is then monitoring the performance of all of these audiences and campaigns uh, and then turning on more audiences and campaigns that are working. It is turning off the ones that aren't performing and then it is cycling back and, and it keeps basically going. So across the three um, vectors that we talked about in the previous slide, uh, it is doing all of this with machine learning effectively. So rather than humans having to go in and create audiences, create specific campaigns, create uh, individual 2000 identities at a time, the machine is just doing this for us. And in this category, it is so important to do that because every single day, there are 10,000 new babies coming into the category, right? It's, I, it's not a set and forget category where you have 20 years lifetime value, like when you're selling, for example, um, toilet paper or uh, anything else, uh, you only have that lifetime value when somebody has a baby. When they don't have a baby, you're not that relevant to, to us anymore. Okay, any questions on this slide? Yes? Uh, so our software, um, we use a CDP called Epsilon, uh, and we've actually replicated a lot of that data into uh, an Azure data lake. So for us, having the flexibility of having our own data lake to process all of this stuff um, makes it a lot easier and more flexible when we're connecting multiple API endpoints to it as well. Cool. Okay, numbers. So what did this actually do and what did it actually achieve? Um, across the, uh, across uh, multiple uh, benchmark periods, and we did this because uh, the formula category, I'm not sure if you've seen the news, uh, but has uh, gone through a lot of turmoil lately. Firstly, with, with uh, COVID um, and the pandemic, there was a huge influx of sales which took out all of the stock out of the supply chain. And then secondly, our competitor also had a recall um, in, uh, Q1 of last year as well, which again, you know, they took out 40% of their production uh, here in the US, causing massive issues from a supply chain point of view. Um, so from a benchmark period, when we're looking at this category, or when we're doing the measurement against this uh, case study, uh, we picked prior periods where there was no impact of recall and no impact of um, the, the pandemic as well. Um, and across the three key things that we're looking at, and there are way more metrics that we look at, but these are the ones I can um, easily share. Uh, it did what we want it to do. So firstly, on purchase per dollar spent, which is basically 
transactions, number of transactions divided by um, dollar spent. So um, for every dollar that I spend, how many transactions am I actually getting? So on that metric, we improved uh, performance by over 400% on purchase rate, which you can think of as, as conversion rate. Um, for, for this activation, it significantly improved as well. And then finally, ROAS. Um, so the return on ad spend that we, got, uh, that we were looking at uh, significantly improved as well. So as we've scaled this model to some of our other product categories outside of vitamins, what we're actually finding is that the sales haven't changed, right? But the media cost has halved because we were showing our ads to people that weren't necessarily relevant anymore um, for these categories. Now, if you think about you know, severe cow's milk allergy as a product category, right? If you don't have a baby that has this particular condition, you're not interested in it, um, but you might have displayed certain behaviors on Amazon to say that you might be interested in this category. And the traditional or the old way of targeting would put you into a bucket that would show you this ad. Um, but by using this model now, uh, it's cut down uh, that impression value and significantly improved our efficiency. Any questions on this before I move on? No? Cool. So, uh, three key takeaways from me. So, by using a data clean room, you can deliver that right creative um, to that right audience at the right time, which is so pivotal uh, for baby formula in, in, in particular, but highly relevant when uh, you're entering certain categories and products in, in time. Uh, secondly, you can optimize your media flighting in real time on the fly based on consumer behavior, um, which you know, previously, and you know, I used, we used to buy TV a lot, uh, you couldn't do the in-flight uh, optimization. You kind of have to wait until your buy or that buy period had ended in order to pause media or to make a change in strategy. Um, and thirdly, we're kind of doing all of this using AI and automation at scale, right? The volume of audience creation that we're doing, the optimizations that we're making in flight, it is physically impossible for a human for us to do this with humans, not just here in the US, but even if we offshore all of this stuff. The amount of calculations that this is making in real time and optimizations that it's making is physically just impossible to do. Um, so what does this all kind of mean uh, to, to everyone in this room today? Um, my key learning here is that everyone needs to get good, especially in marketing, everyone needs to get good at uh, data fluency uh, and understanding how different data points within the marketing and sales uh, and supply chain now um, ecosystems can actually connect with each other and then what can you actually do with that as well, right? So the technical part of data science, not very hard anymore. And the technical part of building products or building software products, not very hard anymore. But that key understanding of how do consumers buy a category? What is that path to purchase? What are those points of influence that I can have as a brand marketer? Um, understanding that and then creating a plot or creating a test uh, to kind of see if you can validate that or not uh, has been key. Secondly is uh, starting small and cheap, right? We, I had, we had to go through this, uh, this, firstly the pandemic, but secondly this competitor recall. We started with our vitamins portfolio because there was no disruption to that category, right? Ideally we wanted to start with uh, formula, but we just couldn't do it because we didn't have the stock um, to do it at the time. So we started small, it worked, then we scaled it up to everything else. And then thirdly is, is always be learning. Um, you know, at the beginning of my career, data science and marketing wasn't a thing. At the beginning of my career, Shopify wasn't a thing. Facebook wasn't a thing. Google wasn't a thing. Um, so constantly be looking at what is the new way of doing things, um, but really understand that ultimately as marketers, we're, we're solving problems for our customers. Cool. That's it from me. Thank you so much, guys. And if you want to connect with me, please feel free um, to, to reach out on LinkedIn, uh, subscribe to my podcast. And, oh, yeah. I have a question. Maybe it's not, it's not as much like with the case study, but I'm just like curious. Do you guys, are these questions really good at the developer? You might not be able to like, track how many kind of repeat customers, like for example, how many after like the second, third, they come back, or is it, or is it just 
that you treat everyone as community at the time? Um, that's a very good question. And um, baby number two and three has a higher brand loyalty versus baby number one. So if you started on a particular brand and you have baby number two and three, if baby, baby one was very uh, good with the formula and you had no issues, then you're very high, much higher propensity to buy again, same brand, right? Um, now, from our CRM, when we sample products, um, we are looking at households. Um, so we are looking at the, you know, the distance between the first sample and the second sample uh, as well. So you know, for every new baby is a new baby, and your second baby might have formula feeding issues that your first baby didn't have, or, or vice versa as well. Um, but given that there is such a high lifetime value for each child, um, it's very important for us to, to talk to you at, at that relevant point in time. Yes. That was basically just from the use of the team room and the people knowing. Yes. Well. Yes. Do you think that the bid, the CPM bid, will increase in that space to drop the ROAS back down to a more historic level? Right? Because that's those are two levers. Like there's Amazon selling a much more premium product now, much more targeted product and competition product. Yes. Shouldn't the advertisers be willing to pay more for that? The ROAS is that so that comes down to competition. How smart is your competition? and uh, are they bidding up the category or not? Because it's an auction model, um, that depends more on competitors than it does on Amazon. So how much is your competitor willing to pay really impacts how much does your impression cost. Yep. Um, do you see, do you have any insight on whether companies are taking steps to avoid triggering those customers who were formerly loyal and now? Yeah. This situation happens, um, and we have an internal process that kind of, you know, once, um, once a sample gets sent out, it's been sent out, right? Like, it's very hard for us to know what's happened. Um, but in terms of our customer care team, uh, when we are notified of these things, we have an internal process to kind of you know, apologize and uh, try to be empathetic towards the situation. But yeah, these cases happen. You can't, we can't predict everything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, no, this is a very common question. And funnily enough, we actually see uh, a lot of foreign debt toll, like gray market debt toll hit the US market, uh, and especially around like concentrations of uh, Asian people, like there are debt, you can find debt toll yeah. here in the US in lots of places. Um, Lysol is just a brand heritage that we have here, it's a multi-billion dollar brand. Um, trying to grow a new brand uh, is a little bit difficult. Uh, could it happen? Maybe. Um, but yeah, here in the US, the focus is, is Lysol. Yes? Um, this is more of like just a macro question, but what's, what's the advantages of having under one umbrella a bunch of different brands versus having everyone associate like all these different products with the brand? Like, I wouldn't know every single brand. What's the advantage? Uh, when I did my job interview at Reckitt, I had no idea who Reckitt was. Uh, until I saw that slide, I'm like, wow, I've, uh, I don't know what the number is here in the US, um, but in the UK and in Australia, I think the number is like 95% of uh, households have at least one record uh, product in their household in, over the last 12 months. So coming back to your question, um, I'm not sure. Like this is, you know, we've been a house of brands and we kind of are very, you know, if you think about the CPG playbook, it's very much about leveraging your supply chain, driving that efficiency and cost. And then same, similarly from a media and marketing point of view, maximizing the ROI that you can get out of your activation, having those retailer partnerships and, and go. That's been the CPG playbook. Uh, and in terms of acquisitions and divestments, you, know, you typically buy and sell brands that fit that overall strategy. Um, 
but yeah, in terms of why not, why doesn't Racket have uh, the same strategy as, for example, Unilever and Procter and Gamble, who are very much more uh, focused on marketing the overall company rather than just their individual brands? Racket's just uh, Racket has a different strategy towards that. What do you mean? Or just, you know, you know, like essentially like the same product, you call it like a commodity, but maybe it's marketed like in a different way to a different segment, or, or perhaps maybe the actual components of it are different. Yeah, the, so uh, good, better, best model. Um, so trade-up model, yes, we have that. So when you uh, sample the product uh, at hospital, typically it's our good formula, um, and then we're advertising to you our better formulas um, to trade up into more premium brands, yeah. Great question. So um, in my 15 year journey within CPG, the volume and the number of ways that I can uh, look at customer insights has significantly grown, right? So when I started my career, we basically had Nielsen looking at market share by retailer. Um, so literally like at uh, aggregated level, um, re by retailer, by state maybe, um, we were looking at what is my share versus what is my uh, competitor's share. About 10 years ago, uh, Dunhumby, which is a shopper marketing company out of the UK, launches, and they, um, they effectively uh, democratize the way you look at loyalty card data, right? So when you shop at um, Target and you're using your loyalty card, um, they're effectively you know, taking all of the transactions historically putting it against that one identity and allowing other people to mine that data, right? Um, so that shopper metric data came 10 odd years ago. Um, so using that old data, now with that shopper data, and then coming into e-commerce and seeing one-to-one -one data in terms of understanding at a one-to-one -one level, what is the marketing interactions on the path to purchase? You know, you get an immense and deep understanding of your category. If you have that deep understanding of category and you understand how does an Amazon shopper enter the baby formula category and, and start to buy for formula for the first time and then the 12 subsequent transactions afterwards, then you understand how, how should I, how can I either influence the behavior within those 12 purchases or how do I disinvest in media and save money because I know showing the media after purchase six makes no sense. So deep category understanding. And there's multiple ways to get that data, whether that's qualitative data or, or even quantitative data. I, I've more so leaned on the quantitative, quantitative side uh, through the data clean room, um, but there's a qualitative way of doing this as well. Yes. Great question. Um, so part of my responsibility is obviously uh, looking at the media side of the equation, but it's also looking at the content and the creative side. Through the data clean room, we haven't started testing creative yet, right? Um, but on our creative uh, side of the team, we have an internal team that does all of our DSP creative. Um, so we have a whole process, both from a qual and quantitative point of view, to optimize imagery for, for conversion as well. And we're looking at that separately, but it's not to the size and scale of this stuff. There's a whole heap of AI tools out there right now that put like heat maps on your ad creative before you've uh, put them in flight. Um, so we're using stuff like that just to optimize it for what we're trying to, what that creative really needs to do, um, but it's not to the scale of, of this yet. Uh, 
Um, tools, okay. Uh, that comes, one, you need to think about what um, brand and category um, that you're heading into. Like the metrics for fast fashion or fashion as a category is very different to CPG. I'm, I, I've worked my entire year in uh, life in CPG. Um, so within CPG, um, understanding Nielsen, understanding shopper metrics across Dunhumby or, or sorry? IRI. IRI, all of the Nielsen base tools, and then also understanding all of the media metrics coming out of Amazon would be like a great place to start. Um, but I say that uh, as a good foundation, but then you need to deeply specialize in your own category and understand, it comes back to first principles thinking, right? Like you really need to come back to basics in terms of what your consumer does in that particular category uh, and understand where you have influence. And there's, there's thousands of tools. You'll find the tools, just Google it, you'll find the tool. Um, but you won't necessarily find the insight that you're really looking for on Google. No more questions. All right, so how awesome is this? Ooh, big round of applause.